Ever wondered how some people manage to cheat death? Today we are diving into a compilation of incredible survival companies. These heroes faced unbelievable danger, and somehow, they lived to tell the tale. Get ready for some heart-pounding moments and see how they defied the odds. Trapped in Icy Water One sunny day in May 1999, Dr. Anna Bogenholm, a 29-year-old doctor training to be an orthopedic surgeon, was enjoying a ski trip on a familiar trail near Narvik, Norway. She knew every twist and turn, but then disaster struck. As she skied over a hidden gully, she lost her balance and plunged headfirst into the icy river below. Trapped underwater, Bogenholm struggled against the freezing current. Luckily, she found a small air pocket that allowed her to keep breathing, but the cold water rapidly stole her body heat. After 40 minutes of fighting the current and desperately trying to free herself from the ice, exhaustion set in. Hypothermia, a dangerous condition where your body loses heat faster than it can make it, began to take hold. Her heart, nervous system, and other organs were slowly shutting down. Fortunately, her companions weren't far behind. They frantically searched for her, and after another 40 agonizing minutes, managed to break through the thick ice and pull her out. By this point, Bogenholm's body temperature had plummeted to a dangerously low 57 degrees Fahrenheit. Her vital signs were undetectable. She was clinically dead. But hope wasn't lost. Emergency doctors rushed her into surgery and used a special heart-lung bypass machine to warm her blood. This critical procedure slowly brought her body temperature back up, and miraculously, Bogenholm's heart began to beat again. The road to recovery was long and arduous. It took several months of rehabilitation for her to regain her full strength. Although she did experience some lingering tingling in her hands, Bogenholm eventually made a complete recovery. Remarkably, Bogenholm's case became a medical milestone. It helped doctors understand the potential benefits of therapeutic hypothermia, a procedure where a patient's body temperature is deliberately lowered to protect the brain and other organs during certain medical procedures such as some strokes and epileptic episodes, lost in the desert. There is something known as Marathon des Sables. This is no ordinary race. It is a brutal six-day, 155-mile challenge through the unforgiving Sahara Desert. Runners face not only their own physical limits, but a relentless sun and scorching heat. It's a grueling test of endurance, where speed is secondary to survival in one of Earth's harshest environments. In 1994, a determined athlete named Mauro Prosperi, a 39-year-old Italian pentathlete, decided to put himself to the ultimate test in this brutal race. However, a sudden and vicious eight-hour sandstorm forced him to take shelter for the night. When the sand settled and the storm cleared, Prosperi woke up to a horrifying realization. He was lost. Disoriented and with only half a bottle of water remaining, he was alone in the vast, unforgiving desert. To survive, he was forced to make unimaginable choices. With his throat parched and dehydration setting in, Prosperi resorted to drinking his own urine. It was a desperate attempt to stay alive. Two days after getting separated from the race route, Prosperi stumbled upon an abandoned Muslim shrine. It was there that he made a decision that would test his mental strength. Spotting a group of bats huddled together, he knew he had to take a drastic measure. With a knife in hand, he grabbed a handful of the bats, severed their heads, and drank their blood to quench his thirst. This grim act of survival continued for another two days, with Prosperi consuming a total of 20 bats. As days stretched into a blur of scorching sun, burning sand, and gnawing hunger, hope dwindled. With no sign of rescue and despair gripping him, Prosperi made another heart-wrenching decision. He attempted to take his own life by slitting his wrists. However, due to severe dehydration, his blood had thickened to the point where it wouldn't flow freely. In that moment, instead of succumbing to despair, Prosperi interpreted this as a sign to keep fighting. With renewed determination, he left the shrine and continued his trek across the unforgiving desert. On the eighth day, a glimmer of hope emerged. Prosperi stumbled upon an oasis in the vast desert. He finally managed to drink clean water. The next day, his prayers were answered. He spotted a group of shepherds, who upon seeing his weakened state, immediately called for help. 
Mauro Prosperi, after nine grueling days lost in the Sahara, was finally rescued. Poon Lim. If you think being stranded in the desert was bad, imagine surviving alone at sea for over four months. That's exactly what happened to Poon Lim, a 24-year-old Chinese seaman. In November 1942, Lim was serving on the British merchant ship Ben Lamond. The ship set sail from Cape Town, South Africa, on a routine cargo run across the Atlantic Ocean. Their destination was Paramibo, in Dutch Guiana, which is present-day Suriname tragedy struck 750 miles off the coast of South America. A German U-boat unleashed a deadly torpedo attack, tearing into the Ben Lamond. In the chaos, Poon Lim jumped overboard. Struggling to stay afloat, Poon managed to find a life raft amidst the wreckage. Miraculously, a small tank of water and a few cans of food were scattered amongst the debris. But Poon Lim wasn't one to simply wait for rescue. He made a makeshift fishing line from whatever scraps he could salvage. This allowed him to supplement his dwindling rations with fish he caught. As his ordeal stretched on, Poon Lim was pushed to his limits. The sun beat down mercilessly, his supplies dwindled, and dehydration became a constant threat. On the verge of giving up, Lim noticed the birds circling his raft. In a desperate attempt to quench his thirst, he caught one and drank its blood. The birds became a small source of food and water, but they also attracted sharks. These unwelcome visitors were a constant danger. Lim wouldn't give in to fear, though. He devised a risky plan. Using bird meat as bait, he lured the smaller sharks close. Then, with a makeshift club, he fought back. If a shark took the bait, he'd haul it onto the raft and kill it. The shark meat provided protein, but for Lim, a special treat were the fins, a delicacy from his homeland. For an astonishing 133 days, Poon Lim drifted at the mercy of the currents. Each day brought a new challenge yet, Poon Lim persevered. Finally, after what seemed like an eternity, fortune smiled upon him. Brazilian fishermen spotted his raft ten miles off the coast. They pulled him aboard, a weary but alive survivor. Newspapers reported Poon Lim was understandably sunburned and had lost a significant amount of weight, but remarkably, his health was otherwise good. Doctors attributed some stomach problems to his diet of raw fish during his ordeal, buried alive. Sometimes even happy relationships can take a dark turn. Mikalina Luandowska, a young mother of 27, was living a seemingly normal life with her partner, Marcin Kasperzak. But beneath the surface, trouble was brewing. Allegedly, Kasperzak became bored with the relationship and hatched a sinister plan. According to reports, Kasperzak enlisted the help of an accomplice, 18-year-old Patrick Boris. Together, they subdued Lewandowska with a taser. Helpless and terrified, Lewandowska was then bound and trapped in a confined cardboard box. This wasn't the end of the nightmare. They buried the box with Lewandowska inside, leaving her with only a few inches of space between her and the earth above. With only her engagement ring and a will to survive, Lewandowska found herself in a desperate fight for her life. She rationed the limited air trapped within the box, conserving every precious breath. In an act of remarkable courage, she used her engagement ring to cut through the cardboard, eventually managing to free herself from her underground prison. After escaping the box, Lewandowska was fortunate enough to flag down a passing motorist who alerted the authorities. Marcin Kasperzak was ultimately found guilty of attempted murder and sentenced to 20 years in prison for his heinous crime. His alleged accomplice, Patrick Boris, was however acquitted of attempted murder. Alone in the Canyon Aaron Ralston's story of survival is as harrowing as it is inspiring. You might recognize it from the movie 127 Hours, but for those unfamiliar, here's a glimpse into his incredible ordeal. Back in 2003, Ralston, an avid adventurer, found himself exploring the canyons of Utah's Canyonlands National Park. He was hiking solo in Blue John Canyon, a remote and narrow passage known for its dramatic beauty. But beauty can turn perilous in a heartbeat. While navigating a tricky descent, a massive boulder shifted, pinning Ralston's right arm against the canyon wall. Imagine being trapped, alone, in a secluded spot with no way to escape. That was Ralston's terrifying reality. For five long days he clung to hope, 
rationing his packed water and snacks. Rescue seemed like a distant dream. The location was off the beaten path, and crucially, Ralston hadn't told anyone about his planned hike. As his supplies dwindled and the harsh reality of his situation sunk in, Ralston knew he had to take an unimaginable step. With no other option, he made the agonizing decision to amputate his own arm. Using a dull pocket knife included in his multi-tool, he sawed through bone in a desperate bid for freedom. The pain must have been excruciating, but the will to survive was stronger. Once free, Ralston embarked on a seven-mile trek back to his truck. Miraculously, during this trek, a family spotted him and alerted the authorities. He had lost 40 pounds during his ordeal, but even more remarkably, he somehow managed to survive the blood loss. Today, he continues to scale mountains and inspires others with his story of courage and determination. Surviving Hell Imagine a scenario where surviving a horrific plane crash is just the beginning. This was the harrowing reality for three American airmen in 1943. On May 27, 1943, their aircraft malfunctioned during a rescue mission in the vast Pacific Ocean. Disaster struck as the plane plunged into the sea. The wreckage left three crew members clinging to life on a small raft. This included Sergeant Francis McNamara, 2nd Lieutenant Russell Phillips, and Lieutenant Louis Zamperini, a renowned distance runner and Olympian from the 1936 Berlin Games. For 47 days, they battled the unforgiving elements. Hunger gnawed at their bellies, and thirst parched their throats. They relied on their resourcefulness, catching fish and collecting rainwater to stay alive. Yet, despite their resilience, tragedy struck again. Sergeant Francis McNamara succumbed to the harsh conditions after 33 days adrift. Just when it seemed things couldn't get worse, they were spotted by a Japanese patrol. Rescue turned into capture, and their ordeal took a terrifying turn. They were imprisoned in Japanese POW camps. For Zamperini, this captivity became a personal hell. A particularly sadistic camp sergeant, Mutsuhiro Watanabe, nicknamed The Bird, singled out Zamperini for relentless torture. He forced fellow prisoners to savagely beat Zamperini for hours and made him hold heavy beams in excruciating positions until he collapsed. Despite the relentless physical and mental torment, Zamperini's spirit wouldn't break. He clung to the hope of survival and the belief that he would see freedom again. Miraculously, Zamperini did survive the war and was finally liberated in 1945. He later found solace through religion and even attempted to forgive his tormentor, Watanabe. However, Watanabe refused to meet with him. Zamperini's incredible story went on to inspire millions. His ordeal was chronicled in Laura Hillenbrand's best-selling book, Unbroken, published in 2010, which was later adapted into a major Hollywood movie released shortly before his death in 2014. While Russell Phillips also survived the ordeal, he chose to remain private and never fully disclosed the horrors he endured. Stranded in the Freezing Wilderness 21-year-old Helen Claiborne had an adventurous spirit and a desire to travel from Fairbanks to Seattle. To save some money, she hitched a ride with 42-year-old Ralph Flores, who happened to be an amateur pilot. Little did they know, their journey would take a dramatic turn on February 4, 1963, when Flores's plane crashed in a snowstorm in the remote Canadian wilderness. Despite suffering broken bones and other injuries, they miraculously survived. Stranded in the freezing wilderness, they faced a grim reality. No survival gear, just a few cans of sardines, tuna, fruit cocktail, and some vitamin pills. With temperatures plummeting to a bone-chilling minus 42 degrees Fahrenheit, they improvised, using the plane's carpet as a makeshift blanket and stuffing clothes and spruce boughs into cracks to keep warm. Their only source of light and warmth was a campfire fueled by gasoline from the plane's tank. As days passed, their meager food supply dwindled, leaving them with only melted snow to sustain them. Claiborne vividly described their plight to the media, water for breakfast, water for lunch, and water for supper. Thankfully, their excess weight allowed them to survive off their body fat for an astounding 42 days. It wasn't until another aircraft spotted them that their ordeal finally came to an end. Lost in the Australian Wilderness 
This next story is as strange as it is harrowing. It's the tale of Ricky Miggy, who vanished without a trace in the unforgiving Australian outback, only to reappear 71 days later, a changed man. On January 23, 2006, Meggy was driving across the vast outback on his way to a new job. He offered a ride to a group of hitchhikers along the desolate highway. Here, the details blur. The next thing Meggy remembered was waking up in a shallow grave, the harsh Australian sun beating down, and the unsettling sound of dingoes scratching at a sheet of plastic covering him. Dazed and disoriented, Meggy found himself alone in the unforgiving wilderness. His car was nowhere to be seen, and with no clue as to his location, he was forced to confront a daunting reality, survival. For the next 71 days, McGee became one with the harsh outback environment. He built a rudimentary shelter, a humpy, as they call it locally, using whatever materials he could find, branches and leaves. Hunger gnawed at him constantly. To survive, McGee resorted to a diet of frogs, leeches, and even snakes. His only source of hydration was his own urine. The ever-present threat of dingoes forced him to barricade his makeshift shelter with rocks each night. Finally, after enduring unimaginable hardship, Meggie was spotted by workers on a remote cattle ranch. He was by then a gaunt figure wasted away to a skeleton. He had lost over 100 pounds during his ordeal. Rescuers rushed him to a hospital, where he received treatment for severe dehydration and malnutrition. The mystery surrounding Meggie's disappearance remains unsolved. Authorities were initially skeptical of his story, particularly his claim that the hitchhikers might have drugged him. Adding to the mystery, his vehicle was never found, surviving the Andes. High in the treacherous Andes Mountains, a tragedy unfolded on October 13, 1972. A Uruguayan Air Force plane carrying the old Christians Club rugby team and their loved ones was on its way to a match in Chile when disaster struck. The plane crashed against a mountain pass, leaving behind a scene of devastation. On board were 45 people, including players, family members, and friends. While 25 initially survived the impact, the harsh conditions claimed the lives of eight more just two weeks later, when an avalanche roared down upon the wreckage and buried them. Stranded at an altitude exceeding 13,000 feet, the survivors faced a fight for their lives against the unforgiving elements. The thin air made breathing difficult. Their meager supplies dwindled quickly, leaving them with a chilling choice. To survive, they would have to resort to the unthinkable, consume the flesh of their deceased companions, which was preserved by the cold mountain air. Weeks turned into months, and hope began to dwindle. With no sign of rescue and winter tightening its grip, Two young athletes, 21-year-old Fernando Parado and 19-year-old Roberto Canessa, took a gamble. They would embark on a desperate trek through the treacherous mountain terrain. For 10 days, they pushed themselves to the limit, battling exhaustion and the unforgiving landscape. Finally, their determination paid off. They stumbled upon a lone livestock herder. The news spread quickly, and the next day, a rescue helicopter team arrived at the crash site. The story of the Andes plane crash and the survivor's ordeal became a global sensation. It was later documented in the book and movie, both titled Alive. Now it's time for today's subscriber's pick. So far we have seen people surviving the unthinkable, from being buried alive to being lost in the desert. The image we are looking at today shows a very thin-looking girl standing amidst a jungle, purportedly having survived a plane crash. This image reminds us of the incredible story of 17-year-old Julianne Kepke, who was the sole survivor of a plane crash that ripped apart over the Amazon back in 1971. Strapped to her seat, she fell two miles through the air before miraculously landing in the dense jungle canopy. Dazed but alive, Julianne began a harrowing journey to survive. With limited supplies and deep in the jungle, she used her knowledge of the rainforest from her biologist parents to find food and water. She even used gasoline she found to treat maggot wounds. Eventually, she stumbled upon a fisherman's camp and was rescued. Julianne's story is a wild ride of survival, but what about you? Could you survive such an ordeal? Let us know in the comments below. Lost at Sea 
Jose Salvador Alvarenga, a Salvadoran fisherman, became an unlikely castaway in 2012. His story is not only one of survival, but also the human spirit's ability to endure the unimaginable. It all began on a seemingly ordinary day, November 17, 2012. Alvarenga set sail for a routine fishing trip with a young companion named Ezequiel Cordoba. They departed from a small fishing village on Mexico's southern Pacific coast, expecting to be back within 30 hours with a bounty of shark, tuna, and mahi-mahi. However, fate had other plans. Just a few hours into their journey, a fierce storm struck. For five days, they battled the relentless waves, their small boat tossed like a toy in a bathtub. The storm not only knocked them far off course, but it also wreaked havoc on their equipment. Alvarenga's attempts to contact his boss for help were thwarted by a disabled radio, one of many casualties of the storm. The boat's motor also sustained damage, leaving them adrift with limited resources. A search party was launched, but after two days of combing the vast ocean with no sign of the fishermen, their hope dwindled. Alvarenga and Cordoba were presumed lost at sea. Now totally alone and facing a terrifying reality, the two men were forced to rely on their resourcefulness to survive. Their once abundant supplies had vanished, replaced by a desperate hunt for anything edible. Raw fish, turtles, and even jellyfish became their meals. To quench their thirst, they drank rainwater and even resorted to turtle blood. Weeks turned into months, and the harsh conditions took a toll. Cordoba's health deteriorated significantly, likely due to the prolonged consumption of raw food. Tragically, he succumbed to his illness. For another nine grueling months, Alvarenga persevered. Then, one day, a speck on the horizon appeared. As he drew closer, the speck transformed into a small island. With renewed strength, Alvarenga abandoned his ravaged boat and swam towards the shore. There he was met by a local couple who, upon seeing his haggard state, immediately contacted the authorities. He had landed in the Marshall Islands, a distance of approximately 5,500 to 6,700 miles from his starting point. Alvarenga's ordeal at sea lasted an incredible 438 days. Horrors of 9-11 The morning of September 11, 2001 began like any other for Janelle Guzman McMillan. Working in her office on the 64th floor of the World Trade Center's North Tower, she was focused on her tasks when disaster struck. American Airlines Flight 11 slammed into the building, sending a jolt of terror through everyone inside. Guzman McMillan, like many others, didn't see smoke or fire initially. Following instructions, she stayed put, waiting for further guidance. But as an hour crawled by and the gravity of the situation became clear, she made the decision to join the throngs of people descending the stairwells. The evacuation was chaotic. On the 13th floor, Guzman McMillan took a moment to remove her shoe, a moment that would forever change her life. Suddenly, the world around her crumbled. A wall collapsed, pinning her legs and trapping her head between concrete slabs. Darkness engulfed her. The only part of her body she could move was her left hand. Panic threatened to consume her, but Guzman McMillan forced herself to stay calm. She prayed for strength and a miracle in the suffocating darkness. Time seemed to stretch on forever, filled only with the echoes of destruction and the gnawing pain in her body. Then, after 27 agonizing hours, a hand, seemingly out of nowhere, reached through the rubble and grasped her one free hand. The voice of a man who identified himself as Paul broke through the silence and assured her that help was on the way. As the sounds of rescue efforts grew closer, Paul instructed her to call out, to make her presence known. The hand that gently let go before the rescuers finally reached her. Miraculously, Guzman McMillan became the last living person pulled from the wreckage of the World Trade Center. Though Guzman McMillan later sought to thank Paul for his calming words during her ordeal, she never found him. Nobody knew who he was. Free falling. Imagine plummeting from a plane at 33,000 feet with no parachute. That's the horrifying situation 22-year-old flight attendant Vesna Vulovic found herself in on January 26, 1972. She was on a work trip, a last-minute switch in her schedule, that would forever alter her life. The plane, a Yugoslav Airlines flight, took off from Copenhagen, Denmark, 
headed for Belgrade. But disaster struck mid-flight over what is now the Czech Republic. A sudden explosion ripped apart the aircraft, throwing Vulovic and the other passengers into a terrifying freefall. When rescuers finally reached the wreckage, the scene was one of devastation. Smoke still hung heavy in the air, and the plane was mangled. Miraculously, they spotted Vulovic amidst the debris. Her legs protruded from the wreckage, the stilettos she had been wearing ripped away by the force of the impact. She had lost a tremendous amount of blood and lapsed into a coma that lasted three agonizing days. Doctors found a fractured skull, several broken vertebrae, and a multitude of other injuries. Against all odds, she clung to life. Vulovic was the sole survivor of the crash, the only one of the 28 on board to cheat death. Officially, investigators determined she had fallen 33,000 feet. This earned her a place in the Guinness World Records as the person to survive the longest fall without a parachute. However, in the late 2000s, a new theory emerged. Two Czech investigative journalists, after examining previously classified documents, challenged the long-held belief that Croatian nationalists were responsible for the explosion. Instead, they theorized the plane was mistakenly shot down by a Czechoslovakian fighter pilot who mistook it for an enemy aircraft. They also said the actual distance Vulovic fell was closer to 2,500 feet. Even if this new theory holds weight, Vulovic's survival remains a marvel. She endured a fall 27 times greater than the height that typically proves fatal. Hit by a train. Getting hit by a car is already terrifying enough, right? Now picture being run over by a train. It's like a whole new level of danger. Truman Duncan, a hard-working guy at a railroad yard in Cleburne, Texas, had a chilling encounter with this kind of danger back in 2006. One moment, he was doing his job as a switchman, and the next, he found himself slipping and falling onto the tracks, just as a massive train thundered toward him. Despite his frantic efforts to escape, the train's wheels dragged him along, crushing his body for 22 meters. He was nearly sliced in half, with one leg barely hanging on by a thread of muscle. But here's where things get really intense. Even in the midst of excruciating pain, Truman managed to dig out his phone and call for help. Can you imagine the courage it took to do that? After what felt like an eternity, the ambulance finally arrived, but paramedics didn't hold out much hope for Truman's survival. They whisked him off to the hospital by helicopter, where doctors were stunned that he was still breathing. In the emergency, medical staff worked tirelessly for three hours to clean Truman's wounds removing gravel, dirt, and grass. He was then placed in a coma for three weeks while doctors battled to save his life. The extent of his injuries was staggering. Truman lost his left leg at the hip, his right leg above the knee, and even a kidney. But against all odds, he pulled through. After enduring 23 surgeries and a grueling recovery process, Truman defied expectations once again by returning to work, this time in an office role just six weeks later. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.